In philosophical disputes on abortion, it is commonly thought that the debate ultimately comes down to whether or not the fetus is a person. That is, a morally valuable being with full and equal rights, including the right to life. If the fetus is a person, then most, if not all, abortions constitute murder. But if the fetus is not a person, then there is nothing at all wrong with abortion, as it does not constitute any rights violation. However, philosopher Judith Jarvis Thompson challenged this commonly held belief in her groundbreaking 1971 paper, A Defense of Abortion. Thompson argued that abortion is morally permissible even if the fetus is a person because of the mother's right to bodily autonomy. Specifically, she contended that a woman has the right to deny the use of her body to another being. To illustrate this point, Thompson asks us to consider a thought experiment involving a famous violinist. You wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in a bed with an unconscious violinist. A famous unconscious violinist. He has been found to have a fatal kidney ailment, and the Society of Music Lovers has looked through all the medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have, therefore, kidnapped you, and last night the violinist's circulatory system was plugged into yours, so that your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from his blood as well as your own. The director of the hospital now tells you, Look, we're sorry the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would never have permitted it if we had known. But still, they did, and the violinist is now plugged into you. To unplug you would be to kill him. But never mind, it is only for nine months. By then he will have recovered from his ailment and can safely be unplugged from you. Is it morally obligatory for you to stay plugged into the violinist? The intuitive answer is no. But then it's also not wrong for a pregnant woman to get an abortion. In the same way that it is permissible to unplug from the violinist, it is permissible for the pregnant woman to unplug from the fetus by getting an abortion. Or so Thompson argues. What should we think of the violinist argument? I think we should reject the violinist argument. Philosopher Brian D. Parks highlights why, almost perfectly in his paper, The Natural Artificial Distinction and Conjoined Twins, a response to Judith Jarvis Thompson's argument for abortion rights. In what follows, I will present and defend Parks' rebuttal to the violinist argument. To make a concise statement, the violinist analogy is a false analogy because it ignores the distinction between the natural and the artificial. Consider the fact that pregnancy is natural. Three points are in order here. First, pregnancy emerges from the design of the human body. It represents a work of nature, not a result of human engineering. Second, pregnancy is an involuntary bodily process. It proceeds unconsciously on its own through bodily forces that are internal to the mother and the fetus. Third, pregnancy constitutes a typical part of the process of human development. It entails a biological dependency that is universally found in the human community and that underlies the birth of every human being. Every woman faced with the difficulties of a pregnancy was once a fetus in the womb, dependent on her mother, surrogate or otherwise, in the exact same way that her unborn child is dependent on her. On the other hand, the violinist analogy is artificial. Note three counterpoints. First, to establish the initial connection, the surgeons must impose a number of elaborate technologies onto the bodily systems of the violinist and the donor. These technologies force the body to function in ways that are grossly contrary to its design. Second, the process of fluid exchanges that occurs in the experiment cannot proceed on its own. It requires continuous external support even after the initial connection has been established. For this reason, it does not represent an involuntary bodily process. Third, the need for an organ transplant, as exhibited by the violinist, does not constitute a normal human need. It constitutes a disease, a failure of the body to function properly. In the example, this need is satisfied in a highly unusual manner. No one has ever drawn life from the body of another person in the way that the violinist draws life from the donor. Now one might be skeptical of the moral significance of the natural artificial distinction. Thankfully, Parks gives us a thought experiment of his own to justify the moral significance of such a distinction. The thought experiment involves conjoined twinning. 
The only phenomena other than pregnancy that entails a natural bodily union between two human beings. Quote, Consider then the hypothetical example of Amy and Janie, two teenage twins who are conjoined at the chest and abdomen. Except for the impaired lifestyle brought about by their unusual physical condition, Amy and Janny are both normal human beings, fully capable of rational thought. They each possess a functional brain and a full complement of organs and appendages. As conjoined twins, Amy and Janny share a number of important blood vessels in the conjoined regions of their bodies. Their circulatory systems are interconnected through these blood vessels. Unfortunately, this feature of their condition has made the problem of safely separating them from each other unusually difficult to solve. The twins have remained conjoined until this point because their parents have not had access to the innovative technology that would be necessary to separate them. Fortunately, a charitable group of highly skilled surgeons who have successfully separated similar cases of conjoined twins have become aware of their condition and have extended an offer to help. The problem, however, is that Janie cannot currently survive on her own. She recently acquired an illness that has caused serious damage to her renal system. Her kidneys have deteriorated so severely as a result of this illness that they no longer have any ability to remove impurities from her bloodstream. She has managed to survive the illness only because of the interconnectedness that exists between her circulatory system and Amy's circulatory system. Through this interconnection, Amy's kidneys have assumed the purification load of Janie's body indirectly, filtering her bloodstream of the impurities that her own kidneys can no longer filter. Thanks to the medical treatment that Janie has been receiving of late, her kidneys seem to be gradually healing and getting stronger. These doctors who are evaluating her condition unanimously agree that she will eventually become capable of independent survival. According to their best estimates, she will become capable of independent survival in nine months. After nine months of treatment, her kidneys will be healed and strengthened to the point where they will once again be able to maintain her body free of impurities. When that point is reached, it will be possible to separate her without causing her to die. Understandably, Amy is extremely unhappy with her life as a conjoined twin. She recognizes that she can survive on her own, and she wants to be separated immediately, or at least as soon as possible. But if the twins are separated immediately, Janny will die. Would it be permissible for the surgeon to perform an immediate separation on the twins at Amy's request, knowing full well that in doing so, they will cause the death of Janie? End quote. The clear answer is no, of course. It is not permissible to separate Janie. But as Parks continues, quote, Consistency, however, would force Thompson to answer yes. After all, Janie's situation is remarkably similar to that of the typical unwanted fetus. Her body is physically joined to the body of a person who considers her to be a significant burden, and her continued survival requires that this person endure the burden for a significant period of time. End quote. Granted, there are differences between conjoined twinning and pregnancy. In the first place, conjoined twinning is far more de debilitating than pregnancy. The typical pregnant woman can perform almost all the functions of a normal person. Amy and Janie, in contrast, can perform almost none of these functions. Secondly, conjoined twinning is highly abnormal to the human species. It results from a defective developmental process that occurs only once in every 200,000 births. And thirdly, unlike the typical pregnant woman, conjoined twins do not bear any responsibility for their situation. They did not make any choices or engage in any actions to bring about their unfortunate condition. But please note, these differences strengthen the argument against abortion. As Parks correctly explains, quote, if ending a life would be unjust in the case of conjoined twins, where there are so many extenuating circumstances in effect, ending a life would seem to be even more unjust in the case of pregnancy, where similarly extenuating circumstances do not exist, end quote. The central question is this. What accounts for our intuition that it is wrong to separate Janie? I submit the answer is found in the natural artificial distinction. The conjoined bodily relationship that the twins exhibit represents a natural, life-directed process. We are inclined to oppose the separation precisely because we believe it would be wrong to cause unnecessary death by destructively intervening with such a process. However, 
This intuition does not carry over to the violinist's example, where the connection is surgically coerced onto the donor's body by outside agents. Now, there are ways a pro-choice proponent could challenge the natural artificial distinction as an answer by offering a competing explanation. One way to go about doing this is to claim, contrary to appearances, that twins actually share a single body, and thus both twins have an equal claim to its use. Separating Janie would be a violation of her bodily rights. Unfortunately for the pro-choice proponent, this view is rife with difficulties. First, it's extremely counterintuitive to suggest that the twins share a single body. If they did, then half of Janie's organs and appendages would lie outside the boundaries of her skeletal structure and peripheral nervous system. If she were to strike Amy in the lower back, for example, she would be causing trauma to her own kidneys, but she would feel nothing. Her sister would be the one who feels the pain. This implication borders on unintelligibility. Probably more troublingly for the pro-choice proponent, however, is the fact that the possibility of shared bodily ownership is not unique to the conjoined twins example. An abortion opponent can just as easily argue that the mother and the fetus share a single body. As Parks points out, quote, We should remember that abortion supporters often claim that the mother and the fetus are one body and not two. The irony is that this claim, if true, would lead to the conclusion that the bodily resources at stake in the abortion debate belong just as much to the fetus as they do to the mother, end quote. Finally, if Thompson were to account for our intuitions with an appeal to the notion of shared bodily ownership, she would undermine the principles behind her own position. Suppose that Janie's situation deteriorates even further, and the interaction between her circulatory system and Amy's circulatory system becomes inadequate to keep her alive. The doctors determine that she needs a full-on kidney transplant to survive. Given that Amy has two healthy kidneys, and given that she needs only one of them to live, would it be permissible for the doctors to force her to make the necessary donation? Those who make the argument from shared bodily ownership would have to answer yes. According to their argument, the two kidneys inside Amy's body belong, in part, to Janie, and therefore Janie has an equally legitimate claim to use them for her survival. Notice the problem. Thompson makes her case by arguing against the concept of forced bodily donations, and yet this line of reasoning ultimately compels her to support it. Another route a defender of Thompson could take is the conjoined twin history explanation. Amy and Janie have been conjoined for as long as they have existed. They have never lived in physical separation from one another. Prior to the pregnancy, however, the mother lived her entire life in physical separation from the fetus. A pro-choice proponent could argue that this difference, a difference in the history behind each connection, explains why the two cases should be treated differently. Basically, the conjoined twin has never known a life of independence and autonomy, while the average pregnant woman has lived such a life. The problem with this response is twofold. First, the condition of a conjoined twin is far more debilitating than the condition of a pregnant woman. Even if Amy were more accustomed to her condition than the typical woman seeking an abortion, her suffering in remaining a conjoined twin would still be far more intense. Second, the longer a person suffers unjustly, the stronger her claim is to be relieved of her suffering. In that sense, the painful history behind Amy's condition strengthens her demand for a separation. She has had to endure the misery of her physical situation for many years, whereas the typical pregnant woman seeking an abortion has only had to endure the pregnancy for a few weeks. To put the twin history objection to rest, Parks constructs a modified violinist analogy. It goes as follows, quote, Instead of supposing that the members of the Society of Music Lovers connected you to the ailing violinist as an adult, suppose that they somehow connected you to him at birth, when you were both newborn infants, or even earlier, when you were both unborn. Suppose additionally that from your first memories as a child, you were trapped in a bed with your bloodstream hooked up to the violinist's bloodstream through an elaborate group of tubes surgically inserted into your body. As a teenager, you finally get an opportunity to unplug yourself from the tubes and escape. Surely, you have much of a right to unplug yourself in this modified scenario, as you do in Thompson's original scenario. 
The fact that you have never lived an autonomous life, and that you have nothing in which to compare your present suffering, does not undermine your right to disconnect yourself. Likewise, the fact that the violinist has used your kidneys for as long as you have used them, or for as long as you have been conscious, does not mean that he now owns them, or that he now has the right to use them for his survival. Notice that there is only one difference between the scenario of the conjoined twins and our modified violinist scenario. In the scenario of the conjoined twins, the connection is natural and internal to the body. In our modified violinist scenario, the connection is externally forced onto the body through the use of an extreme technology. If Thompson were to take the intuitive route, which is to oppose the separation in the conjoined twin scenario, and support it in our modified violinist scenario, then she would leave herself no choice but to acknowledge the moral significance of the natural artificial distinction." End quote. And with that, the violinist argument for abortion rights can confidently be rejected as unsound. Hence, Thompson is unsuccessful in establishing that the moral permissibility of abortion is compatible with fetal personhood. The pro-choice position is dealt a serious blow.